Watching TV has changed over time. Streaming has become the new norm. That's why Golden State Media Concepts Television Podcast dives headfirst to the world of cord cutting. Want to be on the loop of what's hot in Netflix? Or if it's not a preference, what about original shows in Hulu? We've got you covered. Join us as we fill in the blanks and talk about movies to stream and what show you should be binging. This is the Golden State Media Concepts Television Podcast. I told you Kareem does not get the respect he deserves, Jack. All right. Hello and welcome to the GSMC Television Podcast. We are part of the mighty GSMC Podcast Network, and I'm your masked fashionista of a host, Howard Fletcher. As always, I'm joined by my engineer, Jack the Black Pug. We are both thrilled to be back on the air with you today. If you're new to the show, thank you for choosing us. Thank you for trying us on for size. You have so many podcasts out there from which to select. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's amazing. So we're honored that you picked us. So stick around and we'll do our best to get you to make us a habit. Now, if you're already a veteran listener of the show, well, (laughs) welcome back. We are very thankful that you come by each and every week and you're truly the reason why we are here. So you know what to do. Kick back. We have a packed show for you today. Queen Latifah is going to be kicking some serious butt soon. Clarice Starling, well, she's migrating back to the little screen. Seth Rogen, the Green Hornet, bad movie, funny guy, is making adult tunes. We will see what's popular on Netflix. And I will be giving you my first review of Creepshow on AMC. But first, as always, we have some breaking news. Viacom CBS CEO Bob Bakish told investors on Thursday, which is today, that CBS All Access subscription service is going to undergo a rebranding soon as it expands to incorporate more of the company's cable brands in library programming. Speaking on the company's quarterly earnings call, because I guess we have an insider in there. I'm getting this out of variety. They always got somebody listening in. Now, this is the time of year that a lot of these, all of these companies, actually, after, you know, giving their quarterly numbers, they make their report to their stockholders. They also tell them about plans they have in the future. Bakish says that Viacom CBS is planning to launch a broad pay streaming product in multiple international markets over the next 12 months. Now, you know, their product right now, what they call the -the over-the-top product, the streaming product is CBS All Access. Now, CBS All Access will see a user interface overhaul this summer in preparation for relaunch with a new name farther down the road, which means CBS All Access is not performing. Now, I don't have it. They they sh- came on strong because they had the new Star Trek series on it, and it got great reviews. I haven't watched it because I don't have CBS All Access. I saw the first episode because they made it free on YouTube. And it was pretty good, but it wasn't good enough for me to subscribe. As of Thursday, 100 titles from Paramount Pictures, the Paramount Pictures vast film library, including the Godfather trilogy, (laughs) will be made available to CBS All Access subscribers. Now, you know, you ask anybody, not anybody, most people, a big, a large percentage of people, to name their top three movies, most people, especially if they're male, will say The Godfather will be in one of those, you know, in that category. So it's nice to say, yeah, we have The Godfather on our library or in our library, but I don't think anybody's subscribing so they can get to The Godfather since we've all seen that movie. I mean, we quote lines every day from The Godfather, or at least we could. If you hang around with my crew, we do. CBS Corporation was a pioneer among traditional entertainment giants in taking the network and its library over the top, which means streaming, 
in October of 2014. They were one of the first major networks to go ahead and go full, you know, start a streaming product, which was thought of to be radical back then. Actually, it was looking forward. The makeover plan underway calls for the service to add more current and library shows from Viacom CBS cable brands such as Comedy Central, Nickelodeon, BET, Smithsonian, MTV, and Paramount Network. I always have to smile when I see MTV because I'm old. And I, they just, just changed the name of that channel. I mean, they don't play music television anymore. It, it's uh, reality shows. I used to like it. I mean, I didn't watch it religiously, but videos used to be an event at one time. I don't know why they can't come back, but, you know, what do I know? I guess you'd have to have videos on TikTok now. They can only be 30 seconds long. Those brands will also produce original content in the expanded all access down the road, Bakish said. In short, Bakish promised major changes coming this summer as we track toward the rebrand and relaunch of a transformed product. Now, this is a smart move by CBS. You know, many times when you're the first to get into something or one of the first to get in, uh, the the people that come after you have seen how the product works. Everyone's learning together. And so they can come out with a better product. That's why Netflix is just remarkable. Netflix was the trailblazer and they're still ahead of the game. But people like Disney Plus, they knew exactly how to come on with the streaming service they did when they did and how they did with a, with a bunch of really good shiny <laughs> shows to put out there on their pro in their content. And that's why they have, you know, 50 million, some paid subscribers. Now they li listen to this difference. Viacom CBS chief financial officer, Christina Spade said that CBS all access and Showtime and sh they're the same company standalone services at present have 13.5 million subscribers in total. And are on track to hit 16 million by year's end. Okay, I want you to contrast that to what I was just talking about. Disney Plus in six months has 56 million subscribers. That's three and a half times larger than what CBS All Access had. And they had almost <laughs> a five and a half year, you know, head start. So it's not that good. CBS All Access has also reached a milestone on Thursday, rolling out as an app on the homepage hub of Comcast's Xfinity platform. And that's a big deal to most streamers. You want to be able to have an app on the cable provider's service. But again, you want to go over the top, as I said, you want to stream. The future of Showtime has been the subject of speculation since Viacom and CBS Corporation merged in December. Now, Bakish, who's the CEO, as I mentioned, Earlier this year, he talked about bringing more unscripted programming to Showtime, and he raised questions about a larger shift for the premium TV outlet. For those of you who don't know, unscripted programming is like reality shows and game shows. They're things that don't have scripts in general, although reality shows do. Now, for somebody like myself, that's not good news for Showtime, but I understand from a business standpoint that if they need to bring more eyes to Showtime, well... I know shows like Love is Blind and The Bachelor and Bachelorette and Survivor and all of that kind of stuff is hot TV. I mean, they get good numbers, but I don't know if people are going to pay for it. I mean, most of that stuff, yeah, you pay for it on streaming, but you got a whole bunch of other stuff that you can look at, you know, on on Netflix. But I don't know if you're going to pay for it on Showtime, but I've bet against reality television before and I always lose. So he's probably making a good move. Paramount Pictures which is part of CBS Viacom, hopes to stay on track with its planned early August theatrical release of the animated movie SpongeBob, the SpongeBob movie Sponge on the Run. It was pushed back because of COVID-19, but they're going to think they can run it in the fall. Now, Paramount made a decision last month to sell the action comedy The Lovebirds to Netflix because all the movie theaters shut down. Bakish, here's a quote, we saw an attractive monetization opportunity in the early COVID environment. Yeah, you sure you did. Two other highly anticipated movies that are Paramount movies that were disrupted was A Quiet Place 2 and the Tom Cruise 
reboot or sequel, Top Gun Maverick. So we'll see if people start running to the theaters. Now, I'm going to make a little prediction here. My prediction is that those two movies, A Quiet Place 2 and Top Gun Maverick, they'll go to the theaters, but they're going to be streaming really quickly because I don't think they're going to have a long runs. Not that they're going to be bad movies. The Top Gun movie will probably be bad. But A Quiet Place 2, I don't know what the production costs were on that movie, but I think they're going to, you're going to find in the future horror movies are going to go straight to streaming more often than not, and they'll make their money back. Because after this COVID thing, Trolls World Tour showed that you can make $100 million in about three weekends if people want to see your movie. Now, we'll see what happens. But like I've said on this show before, I think streaming is going to be part of the regular model when releasing films. Well, that's it for this segment. Next, I'm going to tell you about CBS again, but this time it's about Queen Latifah kicking butt and taking names. Go get some refreshments. We'll be right back. Thanks for listening. You really can't underestimate the importance of having the right creative work for your brand or your product. Whether it's a logo, a website, a book cover, or an ad campaign, you really need a quality design to make that big difference pop and deliver your overall engagement and success in a competitive market. That's where Design Crowd comes in. Design Crowd has over 750,000 designers from Sydney to San Francisco ready to help you with awesome creative ideas. They make crowdsourcing work for you. So if you need a logo or you're working on your creative branding, you can go to designcrowd.com and post a brief describing the design you need. And then within about two to seven days, you'll receive up to over a hundred different designs from designers around the world. Then you pick the best design and approve payment to the designer. So you're only paying for the design that you want. It takes a lot of the guesswork out of freelancing and out of crowdsourcing. And you don't have to be a huge company like Harvard Business School to use Design Crowd, although they have used it as well. You can start a project on Design Crowd for as little as $99. And if you go right now to designcrowd.com forward slash health and wellness or enter the promo code health and wellness on their website, then our health and wellness listeners will receive up to $150 off of your design project. That's designcrowd.com forward slash health and wellness or entering that promo code health and wellness. Want to know the latest and hottest music hidden the airwaves? Don't be left out. Listen to the Golden State Media Concepts Music Podcast. Keith keeps you on the loop with everything you need to know from pop, rock, hip hop, and the top 40. And we'll throw in news of your favorite artists, concert and tour dates, and so much more. Listen no further because this is the gold standard in music podcast. All right, we are back. <laughs> yeah, I picked that up. That's good. All right. Well, I'm back with some, it's probably some, I'll call it breaking news. As I said, going into this segment, CBS. Now, this is the network CBS, not CBS over the top, uh, which is unnamed yet, um, is coming out with some new shows. They've announced some new shows that they're going to have, three, for the 20. 20- 21 season. I guess it'll start this fall. On the dramatic side, CBS has ordered the Equalizer reboot starring, guess who? Queen Latifah. Yes. Yeah. And also, dramatically, they're going to have a show called Clarice, which follows Clarice Starling of the Silence of the Lambs fame and other related novels and movies. And on the comedy side, the network has picked up what they're calling a multi-camera comedy. I Love Lucy was a multi-camera comedy, so I'm not quite sure what they mean by that. But the name of the show is Be Positive, and it hails from creator Chuck Lorre, who I am not familiar with. But let me get back to Queen Latifah. Yes. The Equalizer, it'll star Queen Latifah 
as how it's described in the press release is as an enigmatic woman with a mysterious background. Okay. How can you be an enigma? If you're an enigma, I guess you are mysterious by definition. But anyway, she's an enigmatic woman with a mysterious background who uses her extensive skills to help those with nowhere else to turn. The show is also oh. going to star Chris Noth. Yes, Mr. Sir. Big of Sex and the City fame. He's also in Law & Order. Much better in Law & Order in my assessment. Of course, I didn't watch a lot of Sex in, Sex in the City, so that's probably not fair. Lorraine Toussaint. Tori Kittles. He's a great actor. Great young actor. I just saw him in a real good indie flick made in 2018, I believe, with Mel Gibson and uh, Vince Vaughn called Dragged Across Concrete. He was really good. Liz LaPyra and Lila De Leon Hayes also are on the show. I'm not familiar with those two actresses. The show received a pilot production commitment at CBS back in November. So they're going to put this together. CBS has already announced it. So I think they are ready to roll with it. Maybe they've already seen some uh, dailies on the pilot or whatever. The original Equalizer, which was back in the late 80s, I believe, starred this guy, Edward Woodward. He's an English actor. He was in the original Wicker Man, not the Nick Cage Wicker Man, but back in the day Wicker Man. That's the only thing I've ever seen him in other than the original Equalizer. That show ran for four seasons on CBS. Yeah, between 1985 and 89. It was then adopted into two feature films, which you all probably recall, which starred Denzel Washington in the title role. One was in 2014, and the second was in 2018. I don't really know what to make of this. I've been always been impressed with Queen Latifah in her acting roles. I mean, she seems to have, she, she can sing, she can act, she can be a tough, and she can be vulnerable. So it'll be interesting to see her in this role. Those of you who listen to the show will probably say, this is not true. I don't like to be the guy to throw cold water on stuff, even though I do it like every show. And I will, this one hopefully will be handled well. I always have a problem when they have these mysterious, enigmatic, highly skilled people in the United States of color. Cause I come from that community. It's very hard to be that, if not impossible. Now, Edward Woodward, the mysterious Englishman who picked up all these skills and no one knows where he got them from or he got them on M in MI6 or wherever he was with that. That's believable. But if you have these skills and you're going around as a black woman doing these things in society, very hard to stay mysterious. They will find you. And, that, and I don't mean that in a tinfoil way. I'm just saying that when somebody like Queen Latifah starts kicking butt, people take notes. And so it'll be interesting to see how they handle this. I hope they handle it in a way that's believable because she is really good. She's very talented. And I would like to see her have a successful show. Clarice, the show about Clarice Darling, stars Rebecca Breeds, who I'm not familiar with again, which is good. I, I hope that this is a relatively unknown actress, and so we get somebody new on television. She plays the FBI agent as she returns to the field in 1993. That's when this takes place, six months after the events of Silence of the Lambs. That should be interesting. Cal Penn, Nick Sandow, uh, and I don't know the rest of these people, Devin A. Tyler, had not heard of her before. Luca Di Oliveria, haven't heard of him before, but they also are in it. So this project received a commitment at CBS back in January. Rebecca Breeds is now going to be the third actress to portray Clarice Starling. The first one was, of course, Jodie Foster, who won an Oscar for her portrayal of Clarice Starling in Silence of the Lambs. And then Julianne Moore, who I thought did an excellent job playing the role in Hannibal. I, you know, anytime you can come behind Jodie Foster in a role in which you won an Oscar for and do a good job. Now, some people were critical of her role. I think she did well because I like Julianne Moore anyway. Um, it would have been nice to have Jodie Foster in the role again, but I can see why she got tired of playing that. Julianne Moore did a good job and it'll be interesting to see how this Rebecca Breeds does in the role. Here's the comedy B positive it's a comedy about a therapist and a newly divorced dad who is faced with finding a kidney donor when he runs into a rough-around-the-edges woman from his past who volunteers her own 
Together they form an unlikely bond and begin a journey that will change both of their lives. <laughs> that sounds hilarious. Well, we'll see how it goes. Uh, certainly an interesting premise. A lot of kidney jokes, a lot of urination jokes. We'll see how that goes. And here's some more breaking news. HBO Max, who I've chosen as the... Uh, now, HBO is hard to call them an underdog, but they're, they're an underdog in the streaming world when you put them against Netflix and Disney Plus, big juggernauts. But I picked them to be the dark horse to, you know, really challenge them for the leading cutting edge of streaming original content. They picked up a half hour adult animated comedy series called Santa Inc. And that property comes with Sarah Silverman and Seth Rogen attached to it. So that's a pretty good bet. The eight episode series follows Cindy Smalls, who's Sarah Silverman, the highest ranking female elf in the North Pole. When the successor to Santa Claus, Seth Rogen is poached by Amazon on Christmas Eve Candy goes for her ultimate dream to become the first woman Santa Claus in the history of Christmas. Now, what I think is interesting about this is that this is not only uh, like a Christmas special. This is eight. Let me make sure I'm right. Yeah, this is eight episodes. So this might be the first Christmas miniseries. And that would be a neat property to have people every year sit down to watch these eight episodes if, it be, if it's that good. Now, um, Seth, and here's a quote. From HBO, Seth and Sarah are a perfect comedy duo for this empowering and very funny animated series shepherded by the hysterical Alexandra Rushfield. Now, I'm not sure who Alexandra Rushfield is, but she's hilarious. Said Lionsgate's head of scripted development, Scott Herbst. Herbst. <laughs> we, we, I'm sorry. We look forward to diving into the world of animation with our Grey Point partners, Grey Point is the production company, to bring the holidays to HBO Max in a totally unexpected and fresh way. I agree with that statement. HBO Max, for y'all to know, is launching on May 27th. Other adult animated shows currently in the pipeline at HBO Max include Close Enough. I'd submit to sounds him. Sounds risque. The Prince. Not sure what that's about. And the reboot of The Boondocks. My homeboy, Aaron Magruder, and U of M alum as well, M being Maryland, not Michigan, uh, he's from Columbia, Maryland. He created and drew and wrote a comic strip called The Boondocks, which uh, was featured a 10-year-old revolutionary named Huey and an 8-year-old named Riley, who were the product of a contemporary culture in the 90s. It became... a uh, animated feature on Adult Swim, and I'm really happy and encouraged to see this coming back. So that's all I have right now for the breaking news on new shows coming up. Next, I'm going to talk about the top 10 shows right this moment on Netflix. While many states are still in a stay-at-home order and you're locked in and you're watching things you never thought you would be watching or have time to watch in the past. Go get some stiff drinks. I'll be right back. Don't go away. Jack, let's go get a snack. You really can't underestimate the importance of having the right creative work for your brand or your product. Whether it's a logo, a website, a book cover, or an ad campaign, you really need a quality design to make that big difference pop and deliver your overall engagement and success in a competitive market. That's where Design Crowd comes in. Design Crowd has over 750,000 designers from Sydney to San Francisco ready to help you with awesome creative ideas. They make crowdsourcing work for you. So if you need a logo or you're working on your creative branding, you can go to designcrowd.com and post a brief describing the design you need. And then within about two to seven days, you'll receive up to over a hundred different designs from designers around the world. Then you pick the best design and approve payment to the designer. So you're only paying for the design that you want. It takes a lot of the guesswork out of freelancing and out of crowdsourcing. And you don't have to be a huge company like Harvard Business School to use Design Crowd, although they have used it as well. You can start a project on Design Crowd for as little as $99. And if you go right now to 
designcrowd.com forward slash health and wellness or enter the promo code health and wellness on their website, then our health and wellness listeners will receive up to $150 off of your design project. That's designcrowd.com forward slash health and wellness or entering that promo code health and wellness. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch, whatever it may be. Visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. All right, we are back and refreshed. Hope you guys topped off, ready to kick back. Listen, I don't know about you guys, but I've watched some things in streaming. I, you know, I do a lot of my work from home anyway, so this stay at home has not really affected my workflow. But I still have, because everyone else is staying home, taken advantage of some of the extra time to watch some things that I normally wouldn't watch on the tube. And Collider. Uh, a, an entertainment website I think is very good. I think you all should check it out if you can. Every day does their Netflix top 10, what's the most popular 10 shows that are being currently streamed on Netflix. Now, I'm recording this on Saturday, May 9th. So that's what this list is from. So on, And so these are the numbers probably from the 8th. And I'm just going to go from 10 all the way to the number one most popular stream show on Netflix only. These are movies and series. I will tell you which is which. Uh, Because I haven't seen all of these. Number 10 is Armed Response, directed by John Stockwell. That's a movie starring Wesley Snipes and Anne H. of Pointless Psycho remake fame. And it was released in 2017. It's an action horror. What it's about is a team of trained operatives find themselves trapped inside an isolated military compound when its AI is suddenly shut down after which they begin to experience strange and horrific phenomena. Might have checked that one out. Number nine is Despicable Me, which is the animated feature film uh, that you all are very familiar with, with the guy from the, you know, with all the minions or whatever. The director is uh, Pierre Coffin and Chris Renault. And voice actors are Steve Carell, Jason Siegel, Russell Brand, Kristen Wiig, among others. It was released in 2010. Wow, 10 years ago. Time flies. This is the film that put Illumination Entertainment on the map and launched a billion-dollar franchise. The first Despicable Me is very much the story of a supervillain named Gru, Steve Carell, going toe-to-toe with another supervillain. Complicating matters is the fact that Gru has just become the adoptive father of three young girls. Silly minion shenanigans, and it's so fluffy ensues. It's cute. Well, that's what happens when you get locked in with your kids. Number eight is The Willoughbys, another animated film directed by Chris Pern. The voice cast is Will Forte, Martin Short, and the beautiful Jane Krakowski. I have a crush on Jane Krakowski. I don't know why, but anyway, I won't see her in this movie. <laughs> it's, that was released this year, and it's a Netflix original. It revolves around four children who are convinced they'd be better off raising themselves. So they hatch a plan to send their parents off on a dangerous vacation. Boy, that sounds like a family show. Number seven, another animated feature, Madagascar. Escape to Africa. That is directed by Eric Darnell and Tom McGrath. The voice cast, long one, Ben Stiller, Chris Rock. I remember Chris Rock said this was the easiest money he ever made being a voice actor. (laughs) David Schwimmer, Jada Pinkett-Smith, Sasha Baron Cohen, Cedric the Entertainer, Andy Richter, 
and my man Bernie Mac. Ah, R.I.P. That feature was released in 2008, and it's the sequel to DreamWorks' animated film. It finds the animal characters attempting to make their way to New York City only to crash land in Africa, where they encounter different animals of their own species. But these animals are wild. Okay. It was very successful in the box office. I do remember that. So, And I'm sure kids love it. Number six, Extraction, directed by Sam Hargrave. Sam Hargrave is a stuntman turned director. It's a, it's, the cast is Chris Helmsworth of Thor fame and David Harbour. It has other actors and I will murder their names. So I'm not going to embarrass myself any further on that one. What is it about? It's, it is a new one released this year. It's about a black market mercenary with a death wish. And he learns to value life again when he's tasked with escorting a young innocent boy out of the dangerous streets of Dekha. It has gotten good reviews from friends of mine who've watched it. I'm not a big action person, but they say the stunt work is pretty good in that one. Number five is one that I reviewed on this show, my last episode, All Day and a Night, from writer-director Joe Robert Cole. It has an excellent cast, Jeffrey Wright, Ashton Saunders, and Yahya Abdul-Mateen II. Brand new movie. It's a Netflix original, and it revolves around a young man living in prison, then looking back on the days preceding his arrest and his childhood to find clues to his way forward in life. Very well done. It uh, Even the description doesn't do it justice. This, this, it's a type of movie that could have been destroyed, <laughs> done very poorly, or it could become a very important movie, which I believe it is. So that's one that I highly recommend. Number four is Dangerous Lies. Director Michael Scott. Cast is Camilla Mendez, Jesse T. Usher, and Jamie Chung. It's a thriller. It's a brand new movie released this year. In Dangerous Lies, a young caregiver inherits her wealthy patient's estate when he dies, only to learn that his fortune comes with surprising strings attached. Now, I saw the uh, preview for this on Netflix. You know, it's one of those movies that pops up when you first sign on. And uh, it looked interesting. So I can see why it's number four. Now, one reason, one of the reasons it is number four, I'm sure, is because they're promoting it. But it looked like a good movie. Number three is another animated feature, Arctic Dogs. The voice cast is J- Jeremy Renner. Well, first, the director is Aaron Woodley. I'm going to give him his props. The cast is Jeremy Renner, Heidi Klum, another woman who's too bad we're not going to see her, James Franco, John Cleese, Omar Sy, and Michael Madsen, who I really like as an actor, great character actor. This is a family adventure. What's it about? This independently produced animated film follows an Arctic fox who works in a mailroom but dreams of being one of the Arctic stars, and I guess that's the company he works for, Husky Couriers. To prove his worth, he steals a package and sets out to deliver it to a secret location. But what begins as a fun adventure soon turns dangerous as he encounters a villain hiding in a fortress. Number two. Now this one is one of these gems that hangs out on cable for a while. Didn't do so well in the movies. It averaged, very average in the movies, but... It is like a, I think it's going to become a cult classic action heist movie. This is a, this is a movie for guys though. Den of Thieves, cast Gerard Butler, Pablo Schreiber, who is jacked in this movie. <laughs> Definitely not porn stash in Orange is the New Black. O'Shea Jackson Jr., who is Ice Cube's son, who's actually a pretty good actor, and Curtis 50 Cent Jackson. It was released in 2019, and what is this about? An elite group of county sheriff deputies set out to stop a gang of thieves from robbing the Federal Reserve in Los Angeles. Now, there are some aerial shots of L.A. I'm pretty sure they filmed most of this in Atlanta from the way it looks, but it's a just, you know, if you like loud action, this is a pretty good heist movie. Pretty good. But it's a lot of testosterone flying around. This is not one for my girlfriend, Joan. But, you know, if I'm, if you're home alone and you're a guy, put that one on. I think you'll enjoy it. And number one is becoming 
It's the new documentary that was just released. What is it about? Well, this is how they describe it. I don't know what's their top secret about it, but they say this top secret documentary is an intimate look at the life of former First Lady Michelle Obama during a moment of profound change as she and her husband exit the White House and decide what's next, focusing their efforts on the power of community. Now, I haven't watched this yet. I am a fan of the Obamas. I heard that this is a very good film. I'm sure I would enjoy it. However, it's listed as a documentary. And since I'm a journalist, I have to define my terms correctly. And the producers of this particular film, Becoming, are Barack and Michelle Obama. So if this movie's about them, I'm not going to call it a documentary. Because a documentary, by my definition, and I think by the industry's definition, is by somebody who's trying to cover something, at least from the outside looking in. A lot of documentaries are biased, like Michael Moore's documentaries do come from, from a particular point of view. However, they're not about Michael Moore. So that would be my only asterisk to this. I see why it's number one, because I'm going to watch it myself. And that's the list. That's the top 10 on Netflix right now, May 9th of 2020. Next, I am going to have some breaking news, but I'm also going to read a couple of emails. Probably, I think I got three. I think I just got another one in. I'm going to read them because I read all my emails on the air, and I want you to write me too. So go get a refill. I'll be right back. Don't go away. Want to find out what movies to go see? Then check out the GSMC Movie Podcast. It's your ticket to the latest movies, whether it's a new blockbuster event, romantic, comedy, or action flick. This show has got it all covered. They talk some what to go see now. Don't bother. What's hot on Netflix and everything in between? That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash movie dash podcast. When it's all about the movies, it has to be this new show. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. (laughs) Yep, yep. It's all good. You gonna watch it? You gonna watch it with me, Jack? Okay. Oh, all right, I'm back. And now this is the part of the show that I know a lot of people look forward to. When we don't have emails on the show, I get hits on Twitter for people to asking me, where are the emails? Well, I would read emails if you guys write them. But if I don't have anything in my email box, I have nothing to read. And so I have something here. And the first email is from my the guy who gave me my very first email on this show. And he is writing me back. I, I've missed it. It comes from... Tyrion Lannister from Westeros, and that's who he is. This is not a joke. Tyrion has written again. Thank you, Tyrion. I was very happy to see your email in my box again. And here's what he had to say. Howard, yes, I'm back, and you still suck. Nevertheless, I continue to listen to your show. I am touched that you have missed receiving my emails and were willing to share that fact with your audience. I know that I don't write very complimentary things about your show. I am increasingly impressed by the consistency of your mediocrity. I keep expecting you to improve, but now I expect that the second coming will arrive before that happens. Will you surprise me? I doubt it. Keep up the bad work. The end. Well, Tyrion, (laughs) thank you. You're consistent as well, my friend. You're consistent as well. Well, you know, I always enjoy receiving and reading your emails. I do. And look, I do try to improve. I, you know, I consider this my craft. I know that probably probably distresses a lot of you because you're saying, gosh, he has no skills. But I'm, I'm working at it. I'm working at it. And I do try to improve. And I thought I was, I was doing so. I really did. Apparently, I am just going to have to try a little bit harder. And I'll do that. You know, I'd like to make a good impression before one of us disappears in the rapture. You know what I mean? And I'll leave it to you to bet on which one of us that's going to be. <laughs> but uh, I'll try. So thanks for writing in, Tyrion. I always appreciate it. And I hope we get another one next week or we get one soon. 
I have another email, and our next email is from Janice from Baltimore. And Baltimore is only about 40 minutes from here. As they say, as a crow flies, I am, uh, I record this outside of DC in Silver Spring, Maryland. She's right up Route 29 from here. And this is what Janice writes Janice says, Dear Howard, I have been listening for a few weeks now and I enjoyed the show. You mentioned that you want some suggestions for what show you would cover after Westworld. And I want to put a bit in for Killing Eve. I know that season three has already started, but I love the show. And you mentioned that you watch it too. I love Jodie Comer and her character Villanelle as well. And you said that you do. If it turns out that you decide to choose a different show, I hope that you will continue to mention Killing Eve now and then. I love your takes on television and the television industry. I've learned a few things from you. And my mother thinks you are funny. Mm, that's nice. Take care of yourself and keep washing your hands. Tell Jack that he's doing a great job. Hear that, Jack? Doing a great job. Best regards, Janice from Baltimore, Maryland. Well, Janice, <laughs> thank you for your email. I really appreciate that you've chosen to listen to me regularly and that you like what you hear. Because unlike what Tyrion thinks, <laughs> I do work at this. If you haven't done so already, please, I wish that you would go rate the podcast, though, on whatever platform you use. It really helps our show. It'll help me to stick around. And I want to know what you think. I mean, you did write me an email and keep on doing that. I really appreciate that. But give me your feedback on there, all of you, if you would. Um, thank your mom for listening as well. Uh, that, you know, I'm glad she thinks I'm funny. Jack is a hard worker, too, for pub. Yes, Jack, I said that. And he, uh, you know, he appreciates the compliments as well. I guess you know by now that I'm not going to be covering um, Killing Eve, though. I'm going to be covering Creep Show on AMC. I'm going to be talking about that at the end of this episode. For the next seven or eight weeks, I think, because I missed the first week last week. So I probably, I think it's eight shows. So uh, about seven more weeks, we'll be doing Creep Show. And although Killing Eve was under consideration, I did think about that. But it's a little bit too far along in the season. I'll still mention the show now and then. Because I like Jodie Comer, too. And I'm sure that I'll have an opinion to share about the whole season once the season is done. And I hope that you send me an email to let me know what you thought about this season. Or you can always send me an email and tell me what you thought about the episode that just, you know, was aired. So thank you for your email. This last one I got from a guy named Jackson who says he's from Berlin. And I can't read it. I mean, I, I know I said I read all emails on the show, and I was very happy to see that it came in. But, you know, there's certain things I just can't read on this show. And uh, it was um, it was it was complimentary in a lot of ways. Thank you very much, Jackson. But if you if listen, to you guys, if you write in, please write in something that is clean, at least. I mean, I don't, you know, this show is not one where we put the little warning about profanity on it. And it's easy to clean up some profane words, but there are certain things I just can't talk about on this show. So thank you. And I look forward to getting more emails in the future. You can always hit me up on Twitter as well. Fletch uh, DC. That's my handle. F-L-E-T-C-H-D-C. So since I have no other emails to read, I will finish up this segment with some more breaking news that just came in. Came in from the Hollywood Reporter. Tamura Morrison, who played Jango Fett in 2002 Star Wars Attack of the Clones, which was a terrible movie, in my opinion, <laughs> will appear in season two of Disney Plus's Star Wars series. Sources say Morrison will play Boba Fett, the famed bounty hunter who first appeared on the big screen in 1980s Star Wars The Empire Strikes Back and who seemingly died in 1983's Return of the Jedi. Actor Jeremy Bullock portrayed the character in the original trilogy. But as you all remember, if you watched it, he always wore a helmet. So it could have been me who played him. So also, he did turn out to be a clone of uh, Django Fett. So it's they got the right actor to play him if he's going to take his uh, helmet off. Boba Fett is expected to play just a small role in season two of the series after the character was teased in the season one episode, The Gunslinger, when a mysterious figure sporting the bounty hunter's trademark spurs approached the apparently lifeless body of Fennec Shand. Okay. 
I didn't watch The Mandalorian. I don't have Disney+. Plus. Now, in Attack of the Clones, one of the storylines revolved around the discovery of a secret army of clones. The clones were copies of Jango, and it was further revealed that fan favorite Boba Fett was actually a clone Jango. See, I was, I was right about my uh, Star Wars trivia. Being raised as his own son, Daniel Logan played a young version of Boba Fett in that film. While sources say Morrison is playing Boba Fett, it's always possible that something sneaky involving cloning is going on. Anything in the movies involving cloning is sneaky, by definition. The Mandalorian Season 2 is slated to start in October on Disney+, Plus, and it will feature another series newcomer, actor Michael Bain. Now, Michael Bain is the actor who played Kyle Reese in the original Terminator movie, the guy who was talking to Sarah Connor and said, he will never, never stop until you're dead. That's how he'll always be that guy to me. Even if Michael Bain played, you know, I don't know, Abraham Lincoln or something, he would still be Kyle Reese as far as I'm concerned. And he'll be Kyle Reese in this Mandalorian thing too. But that's okay because Kyle Reese could hang in Star Wars. You know, he would have actually helped the prequels. I'll tell you that much. And that's it. That's all that I have right now with emails and with breaking news. Next, I will have the last bit of breaking news. Everything's breaking now because no one knows what's happening as far as COVID. And, well, you know, there's things that are opening up. So we're going to see how that affects the TV schedule. I'll get into that next. And then the final segment, we're going to talk about Creep Show on AMC. So get a refill. Go get some more snacks. Jack, get off my lap. Go do your work. And we'll be right back. Thanks for tuning in. Golden State Media Concepts Sci-Fi Podcast. Together we dive into the world of sci-fi and science fiction. From episodes of Star Trek, Star Wars, to The Walking Dead, Resident Evil, all the hot new science fiction movies from the back doors of Marvel or DC. The Golden State Media Concepts Sci-Fi Podcast. You'll never look at science fiction the same way again. All right. No news, man. Nothing good. So we're going to go with this. All right, Jack. Cue it up. All right. We are back. And listen, I looked for some breaking news that was out there that was entertaining or at least interesting. And all of it is like COVID related. And I've done enough of that reporting for now. So this is COVID related, too. But in a good way, I found an article written by a reporter named Maine or Man. I think it's Maine Kachatorian. Spelled... In an Armenian style, I don't know if she's of Armenian descent, but it's not written like chicken cacciatore, the dish. Anyway, this reporter, who is a news editor for Variety, uh, wrote an article called The Best TV Shows You Have Time to Watch Right Now. Now, I guess she's assuming that you won't be going back to work anytime soon, although I know some states are opening up. Now, she made a list. There are 19 shows on this list. Uh, she doesn't say that they're in any particular order. But since they're not in alphabetical order or in chronological order, I have to believe they're in the order of her preference. As I said, there are 19 shows on the list. 11 of them I have seen every episode of. I mean, I am in full agreement with her that they have, they should be on this list. Uh, eight of them I've seen probably one or two episodes of that I wasn't fan of those shows. I did not watch the shows. Uh, I've ranked the shows on this list as well, so... After I tell you where she ranked them, I will tell you where they fall on my list. Naturally, the eight shows that I have not seen are at the bottom of my list, but that's not to say that they deserve to be there. I'm just saying that I really have little opinion of them because I'm not familiar with them. And that's where they ended up. So with no further ado, here are the best TV shows that you have time to watch right now. Ms. Catchatorian's list is in descending order, not ascending order, so that's how I will read the list. Number one on her list is The Sopranos. Hard to argue with that. I have it number three on my list. The Sopranos will probably always be on the top three of my favorite TV shows of all time. 
groundbreaking television from David Chase. Number two on her list is Veep, the political comedy starring Julia Louis-Dreyfus. Very funny woman. I'm a sucker for political. I'm a political guy. I love it. It was a funny show. A little high for me at number two, but it's number seven on my list. Number three on her list, it's Friday Night Lights. On my list, it's number 19. I'm not a fan of Friday Night Lights. Only seen a couple of shows, read the book, not my cup of tea. Very popular, obviously hot popular with Ms. Kajitorian. Number four on her list, Sex and the City. She loves it. Most, a lot of women do. The woman I dated during the time that Sex and the City was on television swore by the show. It's probably why we got along so well. Um, I'm not a fan. Number 13 on my list. Number five on her list, Game of Thrones. That's a good, that's a good choice. Number four on my list. I don't have to say anything about Game of Thrones. All of you are familiar. Number six, 30 Rock. 30 Rock is the Tina Fey comedy. Very popular show. I never watched 30 Rock. I've seen episodes of it, but I never watched it regularly. Mostly a scheduling thing. It's number 12 on my list. Only because of that, I'm sure it's a funny show. Number seven on her list is Breaking Bad. Fantastic show. Breaking Bad is number two on my list. I love Breaking Bad. Groundbreaking television in my assessment. Number eight on her list is Seinfeld. Now, I am one of probably about 10 people in the United States that never watched Seinfeld. Uh, I've seen it in syndication. It's, it's almost, you know, on, in some markets, it's as about as hard to avoid as the Andy Griffith show. Uh, I've seen it and I found it funny, but it's not on my top at the top of my list. It's number 14 only because I'm not really familiar with it. Number nine, the West Wing, the Aaron Sorkin written show. Again, that's a show that I never really took the time to watch. Uh, familiar with it? Watched just some episodes, just never stuck with me. It's number 15 on my list. Rounding out her top 10 is Cheers. I have to agree with that. Cheers, great show, very funny. It's number 9 on my list. I have it up one, just one spot. Number 11 on her list is Twin Peaks. The very strange David Lynch television show. I used to watch it religiously when it was on. Uh, it's number 10 on my list. It rounds out my top 10. She has it at number 11. We're in pretty close agreement with that. Number 12 on her list is Six Feet Under. Another HBO drama. I have it at number 7 on my list, and it's only for historical context. I think that Six Feet Under was a very interesting show when it came on. I like it. It's not a show that I want to go back and watch necessarily. You know, there's some shows that appear under Six Feet Under on my list that I watch again and again. Six Feet Under is not one of those, but I thought it was quality television, and that's why it's up on my list. And I would recommend people go watch it if you have time to watch. Number 13 on her list is Lost. Lost, Damon Lindelof's show. People were glued to Lost when it was on, Who those who watched it. Very controversial ending. I'm going to, I've said here on the show before, but those of you who've never listened to me before know I have never watched Lost. Now, Lost is something that is a show that I'm sure I'd love because I love Dave, Damon Lindelof's other efforts. I like The Leftovers. I loved Watchmen. And when it was on the air, because I heard how intricate the plot was, how involved, some may even say convoluted, I never started watching it because I figured, well, I'll be lost, <laughs> literally, if I start watching Lost now. Now it's gotten to the point where I need to sit down and binge it, and there's just so much content out there, I have to squeeze it in somewhere, but I will. Lost is number 11 on my list. That's the highest place for shows that I've never seen before, just because I have a lot of respect for Damon Lindelof, and I'm sure I'll like it. Number 14, on this Catchatorian's list is Homeland. I have Homeland number eight on my list. It's in my top ten. Homeland just ended its had its series finale a few weeks back. It kind of went off the rails in my off the rails is hard. It it wasn't as good. Eight seasons. The last three seasons or so were mediocre. It started out with a bang, stuck with it. You know how it is. You fall in love with the characters, you keep watching. Homeland is worth the time binge watching. My partner Joan is watching it now. She loves it. Number 15 on her list is Mad Men. 
Now, this is where we have a disagreement. Mad Men on my list, number five. I thought Mad Men was a great show. She obviously, although she's recommending that you check it out, and I recommend it strongly too, I think it's one of the top ten shows that I've watched in my lifetime. Very good. If you like advertising, I like advertising. If you like advertising and if you like uh, stories that tie into some things that really happened during the period of the 60s and the 70s, I think you will like Mad Men too. Number 16 on her list is The Wire. Now, those of you who listen to my show know that The Wire is number one on my list. I think it is the best show ever made for primetime viewing on television. Well, but that said, I will say this along with that, especially when I make a recommendation for people to watch it. It's not for everybody, but it's a good show. It's a show that you have to give a chance. You give it a chance because it's not about, even though the characters are drug dealers and police officers and people in the city of Baltimore who do a lot of what we would call gritty things, that's not what the show is about. The show is about humanity. It's a good show. Number 17 on her list is Frasier. Here's the only one we have do, complete agreement on. Frasier is number 17 on my list, too. Why is it 17 on my list? Because I never watched it, but I do. I am familiar with the character Frasier because Frasier was a spinoff from Cheers, and my mother watched Frasier when it was on, and she thought it was very funny. Eh, whatever. Number 18, The Americans. American's a great show. Uh, I would agree with her that you should watch it. It's number six on my list. I think it's a fantastic show. I would highly recommend you binging it if you have time to watch. And last but not least on her list, number 19 is Curb Your Enthusiasm. On my list, it's number 16. Many of you will think I'm giving it short shrift. I just think it's the same gag. I get it. I get what Larry David's about. Now, my sister loves it. A lot of people say, no, you're wrong. And, and they're probably right. It's an, again, it's another time thing. If I had time to watch it, I probably would. But I get it. Larry David's a grouch. He's cheap. He's sarcastic and he's cynical. Got it. And that's it. That's the list. And if you have time, you're looking for something to watch, I would recommend any of those things on the list, even if there's, if it's a show that I don't have a high opinion of. I know a lot of people who do, who I, whose opinions I respect, so I don't think you can go wrong with any of these 19 choices. Next, I'm going to go over the first episode of Season 1 of Creep Show, which actually aired on AMC last Monday night. I missed it on television, but I caught it on YouTube, and I'll be back with my review. Thanks for listening. Go get some refreshments. I'll be right back. Are you tired of the same old news? Are you sick of the seemingly endless political spin and negativity? The GSMC America Still Beautiful podcast is a weekly news podcast covering all the top positive and uplifting news stories. We cover stories that will inspire, uplift, and remind you of the good in the world. Tune into the Golden State Media Concepts America Still Beautiful podcast to get all the great and positive news stories of today. Download the GSMC America Still Beautiful podcast on iTunes. Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type GSMC in the search bar. All right. <laughs> Boom. It wasn't that scary. And I'm back. And as I just said last segment, I've been telling you guys for the last couple shows, I will be reviewing the latest episode of Creep Show during the last segment of my show until it's all done. At least episode one that's being aired on AMC. Now, there are going to be some spoilers here. I don't think what I'm going to tell you is going to ruin your viewing experience if you haven't seen it before listening to this. But if you want to go to the episode fresh, I suggest you pause this and then go watch it and come back. Each show of Creep Show has two stories in it. Uh, this is the, this series or actually the season of this series, the premiere season of this series, aired on Shudder. Shudder is a horror streaming service that runs Creepshow as original content. Um, they have a, an agreement with AMC to allow them to run the seasons afterward. In this case, they're using it as a almost a run-up 
to their new season, which is coming later this year, season two. The first story in this episode, first, let me, let me take a step back. The, you know, the creep show is based around or it's framed as, uh, like a live action horror comic. Now I grew up in the seventies and eighties during the time when horror comics were very popular. In fact, when I was like 12 or 13, I used to buy these things all the time. And so there can't be stories. Some of them are quite chilling, actually, but there, there can't be stories. And they usually have a, a host or, or somebody who introduces the comics or the stories every time. This time, in Stephen King's case, it is a character called the Creep, uh, a hooded character, almost like a zombie type character, not the Crypt Keeper, like Tales of the, from the Crypt, who I thought is the best. Uh, so I didn't particularly care for the Creep. <laughs> in this good news is, is that the creep isn't important. So I just wanted to mention that, that there is a host, the creep. I don't like the makeup. don't like the special effects. I don't think it was done very well. This first episode was called gray matter and Stephen King fans will enjoy this because it is a, in his first short story collection called night shift, which was published in 1978. Gray Matter has a blend of gothic atmosphere along with monster movie horror. And it's about a teen named Billy that recounts the change of his distraught and disturbed father has undergone while because he lost his wife, tragically. Now, Tobin Bell, who you all know as Jigsaw from the Saw movies, and Giancarlo Esposito, probably one of the best character actors around, uh, to popular audience or recent audiences, he's best known as Gus from Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul. And they star as two local men who head out during a big storm to check on this man, the father of this guy, Billy. And the episode shifts between the boy's story that he's telling another character, played by the lovely Adrienne Barbeau, and the two men who set out to check on the condition of Billy's father. Billy's father has descended into grief, and in turn, that grief has manifested into an addiction to beer with devastating effect. As a metaphor for the damaging effect of alcoholism on both drinker and those in their vicinity, the story works to highlight the horror of losing a loved one to addiction and the pain they can easily cause their loved ones. It's less interested (laughs) in portraying the emotional horror, though. And early atmosphere shifts toward more gruesome aspects of the man's change, in quotes, including some nasty displays of stickiness and wet matter. It's pretty gross. And it builds to a monstrous reveal that befits the horror comic genre. The problem is, in my opinion, is that it's tempered by Adrian Barbeau's friendly and time-consuming use of this old-school adding machine. It's It's silly. It's pretty much the only time in Grey Matter where they seem to have a sense of humor about themselves. But the problem is, is that I can't tell whether this is supposed to be funny or it's supposed to be scary. So I'm just going to say Grey Matter was I, you know, that's about it. The second story was called House of the Head, and it comes from the writer of the movie Bird Box. It's a guy named Josh Mallerman. Now, Bird Box was on Amazon Prime. Uh, It was really big. I guess I don't even know when it was. It seems time's been flying maybe back in the end of the last summer, maybe in the fall. I wasn't a big fan of Bird Box, but it was mostly because of the ending of the movie. It did hold my attention throughout. I will say that. And so did this particular little piece. And it concerns a little girl who has an elaborate dollhouse. And the dollhouse is home to a family of three and their dog. And suddenly there's a new resident in the house. And that's a head decapitated head and each time she opens the walls of the dollhouse to peek through the window or peeks through the windows or does whatever the head has moved and the other figurines are reacting to the head so i won't tell you anymore i don't feel like what i've told you is a spoiler because the dollhouse trope is as old as tv horror anthology series go i mean it 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 had been around it seems like every horror series has an episode like this with creepy dolls or creepy toys, or something's moving every time you look at it. 
Now, the second story, I mean, it lacks the over-the-top nature of the first story and the Creepshow brand in general, but it feels more in line with an episode of Monsters, if you remember that series, which was back in the late 80s, I believe, 88 to 1990, somewhere in there. And it's not necessarily a bad thing. I wasn't a big fan of Monsters, but Monsters was what it was, and that's what about what this thing reminded me of. It's domesticated simplicity, and it works to capture the attention. I mean, I did watch the whole thing, and it did capture my attention. You want to know why these things are moving around? It was just like Bird Box. The premise is intriguing because there is a growing menace, and that's that figure in the house. The fact that we, the audience, never get to see these movements. We only get to see the the frozen reactions of the dolls in the house is actually done quite well. It reminded me of this episode of Rod Serling's Night Gallery, which was another series that I think was in the 70s. It might even have been the late 60s. It was his series after the Twilight Zone called The Cemetery, where you had a painting that changed showing somebody digging themselves out of a grave. And you never saw the painting move, but you always saw the different changes in the picture. And that's what this reminded me of. And it was done pretty well. I will say the director, the way he shoots the view into the dollhouse with a feeling of uncertainty that matches the girls. I mean, every time you look through a window, you don't know what you're going to see. He has a little trepidation there. And there's a steady build towards something terrible. And I think he did that quite well in this. But it was kind of frustrating when the killer ending never arrives. And the story kind of wraps up in a pretty unsatisfying fashion. Now, I know it sounds like I'm panning creep show. I'm not. I really am not. Hopefully, the showrunners were smart enough to start off with sort of a whimper. I mean, the show shows a lot of promise, and I like anthology horror. So maybe they didn't want to lead with their best. And the fact that they did start it out with a Stephen King story was good. It was very smart. I was hoping for something a little closer to Masters of Horror, which was a series that ran on Showtime that I thought was very good. Unfortunately, it was canceled, and I'm not sure if it was production costs or just people, nobody watched it. But I'm hoping that Creepshow can catch up to that. It won't surprise you to know that I didn't do my homework. And I expected to do uh, reviews of Creepshow on my show that drops every Tuesday because I thought that it ran on Sunday nights. Well, it doesn't. It runs on Monday nights. And that's too late for me to get my show out to you on Tuesday. So next show, which drops on Friday, I will be talking about Creep Show episode two. And hopefully I will have a better review or have better things to say about it than I had about this. But I am looking forward to anthology horror. And I hope those of you who do like horror do watch this on AMC and let me know what you think. Please email me at podcasthoward at gmail.com or tweet me at FletchDC, F-L-E-T-C-H-D-C, and let me know what you think. I will read all of them on the show. And that's it for this episode of the GSMC Television Podcast. We are part of the mighty GSMC Podcast Network. I'd like to thank you very much for listening. I really appreciate every time you guys show up for me. Jack the Pug. Jack, Jack's happy too. And um, do do us a favor. Please follow us on Facebook and on Twitter and Instagram. And the most important thing you can do is to subscribe to the podcast. And please, please, please rate us wherever you're listening to us, especially if it's Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Please give me five stars. Let me know what you think about the show. We love to hear from you. Until then, I want you to stay safe. I want you to wash your hands. Don't go out if you don't have to. Keep in touch with your loved ones. And I'll see you next time. Thank you for listening again. I look forward to seeing you next week. Take care of yourselves. Bye-bye. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Television Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network from movies to to music, from sports, to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.